Father, as I speak this morning, I ask that your Holy Spirit guide my words in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, we're working our way through the book of Acts, and Paul last week was in Athens, and now he's just left Athens. He's probably stayed in Athens for uh, maybe a few days or a week or two. He's established a fledgling church, and then he moves down the road to Corinth, about 80 k's further down the road. And... Uh, I can probably move the mouse across there, can I? Here we go. So right here we've got Athens, and then just 80 k's down the road we come to Corinth. Corinth was the capital of the province of Achaia, and it had been destroyed by, uh, by the Romans in 146 BC. And then it was rebuilt about 46 years later. Uh, rebuilt in 46 BC by Julius Caesar. He established it very much along Roman lines, and he used it as a town to settle... Uh, Roman veterans, uh, Roman soldiers who had retired, uh, government officials and the like. And it very quickly became again uh, the, the commercial hub of the district of, of that part of Greece that it had been in the past. It's situated in an ideal place because it's on the isthmus connecting the Peloponnese with the rest of Greece. And so it's got a major port uh, on the left hand side, a major port on the right hand side and it commands that land bridge. And so very easily you can see why a city like that can become a commercial hub, because it, it commands the trade routes. And I've got a slide here of the reconstructed city, and the synagogue, and we know there was a synagogue in there, it would have been in the top right-hand corner, just past the theatre, um, where where the southwestern gate was and as you came in through that gate just tucked on the inside of it and kind of like one of those empty sections here would have been where the synagogue was at that time and also next door to it would have been the house of Titius Justus and these are the remains that still exist today of that reconstruction that you saw in the previous slide so if you went to Corinth today hopped on your tour bus and drove into Corinth and then hopped out you could actually take a walk around um, that re that city and see many of the things that Paul would have, or well, the ruins of that Paul would have walked amongst in that time. But I want to show you a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, the first one is this slide here. This is a paving stone from the east side of the rebuilt theatre, and the inscription on it, if you could read Greek, would say, "Erastus, the commissioner of public works, bore the expense of this pavement." Erastus, the commissioner of public works bore the expense of this payment. In other words, Erastus, who would have been uh, like someone in the greatest council in charge of public works and so on, personally paid for the, the laying of this particular road that ran past the theatre. Uh, now what's fascinating about this is that in Romans chapter 16 verse 23, Paul writes the following, Erastus, who is the city's director of public works and our brother Cortus, send you their greetings. Amazing, eh? In other words, if you were to go back to Corinth today, you could actually walk up to and touch or even stand on this very stone that links our reading of the Bible back to people who were real 2,000 years ago. I find that kind of thing absolutely amazing. Erastus, obviously, through Paul's dealings and working in the city, obviously came to faith. He actually travelled with Paul. We read of him in other parts of the Mediterranean. He came to faith and we still have this little bit of history that links us with this man who became a Christian under Paul's ministry 2,000 years ago. It helps to ground our faith, doesn't it? That the Bible is not just a work of historical fiction or anything like that, but grounded in history. This is real. Here's another couple of interesting slides. This one here is of what they call a capital. It sits on top of a Corinthian column. And we know it would have been in the synagogue. Now, does anyone, could anyone tell me why we think this particular capital would have been in the synagogue? Someone might know. The what, sorry? The why is that? Yeah, that's right. They're Jewish candelabra known as menorahs. They've got, and we know that because how many stems have they got? Seven. Seven stem candelabras. And they're what we call menorahs, and there's three of them there. So this is very much a Jewish uh, inscription, Jewish carving, and it would have sat on top of a Corinthian column. Alright, next slide. 
Here we have uh, the remains of a lintel stone and actually reads in Hebrew, the, sorry, in Greek, the synagogue of the Hebrews. And this would have actually sat over the doorway, possibly not of the synagogue that Paul was involved with, it might have been a slightly later one. Um, and two more quick slides. And these are all things that you can see today if you were to go to Corinth. Now this one I find really fascinating. You look at that and you think, well, that's just a wall, isn't it? It's the remains of the beamer. It's not a car. It's actually um, what we call the judgment seat. And sitting on that little bit of a limestone in the middle, just at the bottom of the wall there, is where the proconsul would have sat when he passed judgment on cases that were brought before him. So when we read through Corinthians, we read about Gallio, the proconsul, who would have been in the beamer, sitting on that very bit of stone, listening to the accusations that were brought against Paul about establishing a new religion and he would have and as we read he passed a judgment on that basically he dismissed the case but that's where Galileo, Galileo would have said this is the judgment seat that's what Bema means in Greek the judgment seat and Paul and his accusers and the rest of the crowd would have sat uh, or stood around that place and you, like I said you can go to Corinth and see these things today and one last one this is just the remains of the Agora, um, as we learned from in Thessalonica. The Agora is the marketplace, and these little wee alcoves in the walls, and there would have been more around the other sides. They were the uh, shop fronts. There would have been trestles in front of them that people would have laid out their wares for selling. And more than likely, either in the Agora itself, or if that was already kind of like well and truly taken over, on the road, the Lectian road that led into this, where there were other shops and stalls set up, Paul. Aquila and Priscilla who were tent makers the three of them were tent makers it's likely that they would have set up shop possibly in one of these areas it probably would have been in the Agora or on the road leading into it so that's one of the fascinating things about um, the Bible that is so different from things like you know, the Quran and things like that and um, the Mormons uh, book you, know, you can actually go to these places you can walk on these sites and you can touch the stones and read the inscriptions. This is truth. This is real. This is history that we are reading about in the Bible. These things actually happened. We're dealing with real people. And so I'll just leave up a, a nice little picture of Paul there as we carry on. So Paul has just left Athens, as we know, and he's travelled to Corinth. And he meets up with Aquila and Priscilla who share the same trade as him. They're tent makers or leather workers. Much, very similar in fact to the work that Alan does down at Kotaku Saddlery today. Uh, anyone know of Alan at Kotaku Saddlery? No? no? A couple of people do. Exactly the same work that he does today. Working with, um, with fabrics and making tents and repairing leather and so on. Paul, Priscilla and Aquila were what they call tent makers or leather, leather workers. Saddlery, saddlery work. And it's probably a very early example of what became a later rabbinic tradition where there was an expectation that if you were going to be a rabbi, to be a teacher of the faith, that you also needed to have a trade in order to support yourself, that you weren't going to be a burden on those to whom you were teaching the faith. So even today it is expected for, for a lot of people within that tradition that they earn a trade, they learn a trade, that they become you know, a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician so they've actually got a means of supporting themselves or something that they can fall back on while they're studying the Torah or teaching others of it. And for Paul, his trade in tent making was one of the main ways that he actually supported himself as he travelled around from city to city. He would arrive, he'd go into the Agora, he'd set up himself and people would come to him because it's a trade that was always in need around the ancient world and including today. And he would do his work, he'd earn some money enough to live on and then in the afternoons or whatever, he would do his work of preaching and so on in his ministry. Paul probably felt, even though Paul acknowledged that he had a right to earn a living from preaching the gospel, he himself chose never to make use of that. Even though he had a right to earn a living by the preaching of the gospel from people who would give offerings and so on to support the work, he felt that he would rather not put any burden on those to whom he was preaching because it might hinder the gospel in some kind of way. It freed him, for example, from any temptation to, to alter the message to suit the ears of the hearers. You know, 
you might go to a place and start preaching and you're getting a little a few people going oh I'm not sure if I like that so then there might be the temptation to alter what you're saying to make it more susceptible for the people who are hearing it or acceptable so Paul wouldn't do that you know he would just preach the truth this is what it is this is what the gospel says and if you didn't like it tough pities there was no temptation because he wasn't expecting any financial reward from the people he was preaching to to alter the message. Likewise, there would be no temptation to say, well, I know they've got a lot of money over in that town. Let's go to that town and do my preaching there because that way I'm going to get lots of offerings. Because he supported himself, it meant that he could go wherever he liked and preach to everyone who had a need to hear the gospel. So he's working as a tent maker. He's working also with Priscilla and Aquila who are also tent makers. They had been expelled from Rome because when Christianity began to spread around the Roman world it established itself in all the major cities including Rome and as we know it began usually within the local synagogues but as we also know that created a lot of tension between the Jews who felt that Christianity was kind of like barking up the wrong tree and there was a lot of tension going on within the synagogues as Christianity took root amongst them to the point that in Rome it had got such uh, it caused so much public disturbance that the Emperor Claudius said to the, to the Jewish community look if you guys don't sort yourself out I'm actually going to take some serious steps and basically they didn't and two years later he said alright that's it I'm going to issue a decree and you're ex- exiled you're expelled from the city and all the Jews had to leave the city of Rome and disappear What's interesting about that though is that it meant that in Roman eyes they saw Christianity as basically an offshoot of Judaism. They saw them basically as the same thing, just two different flavours. And what that meant was that for Christianity it enjoyed the same rights and privileges and exemptions that the Jews did within the Roman Empire. The Jews were allowed to associate together and form communities of faith. They were allowed to build public buildings called synagogues and worship in them and gather as a group. They also, because they were part of the synagogue and because of their beliefs, they were exempted from having to go to the temples and offer worship to the pagan gods, particularly to emperor worship. They didn't actually have to do that. And because Christians were seen as as kind of like an offshoot of Judaism, they were accorded those same rights and those same exemptions which meant the church was not persecuted by Rome in those very early days and therefore it had a freedom in which to grow and expand without any fear of the state coming down hard on it. So Paul is in Corinth and he begins his usual practice of preaching in the local synagogue He does his usual story of explaining from the scriptures that the Messiah had to suffer first. He wasn't just going to come as a conquering king. And then he went on to prove that those same prophecies were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore Jesus had to be the Messiah. He'd been doing that for a little while when suddenly Paul, sorry, Timothy and Silas arrive from Philippi from Macedonia and when they arrive in the city they actually bring with them a gift that's been collected in Philippi not at Paul's request but a gift that had been collected for Paul in Philippi and that gift enabled Paul to give up his tent making and to devote himself exclusively it says to the preaching and the ministry of the word of the gospel so Paul normally would actually kind of like split his time between making a living and doing his ministry but when the gift from the Philippians arrived It meant he was able to devote himself fully to the work of the gospel. And that actually caused a bit of a reaction. Because when Paul was just doing it part time, yes it was creating a bit of a disturbance within the Jewish community, but once he started to do it full time, it really started to get up the noses of the Jews who didn't like what he was doing. And they became so resistant to what Paul was doing, and it became so hot for Paul in the synagogue, that he actually got to the point where he said, I can't do this anymore. You guys are so resistant to the message of the gospel, so blind to seeing what the truth is, that I just can't work with you anymore. And he did a very symbolic thing. He stood in front of them and just shook off his clothes and shook off all the dust of his robes and said, I'm leaving you guys, I'm going next door to the house of Tithius Justice and I'm going to continue my work from there. Basically he was saying, I'm going to have nothing more to do with you. Even the very dust from this place, I'm sweeping off my clothes and going to the guys next door. 
The Jews were resistant to Paul's message, not so much because it was the truth, but rather a truth that they didn't want to acknowledge, because it would have meant for them changing centuries of tradition and changing a lifestyle, and that was just too big a challenge for them to do. So Paul shakes off his clothes and goes next door to the house of Tibius Justice. Now don't think that Paul was unsuccessful in his work in the synagogue. We know that Crispus, who was the current synagogue ruler, had come to faith. He had become a Christian and his family with him. And quite a number of other Jews within the synagogue had come to faith. So Paul had had an effective ministry within the synagogue. Now you might have noticed as we read through the passage that towards the end that it was Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler who was beaten up by the locals within the Agora, which meant that probably Crispus, as the synagogue ruler when he had come to faith in Christ, was probably actually forced to resign or forced to leave the synagogue because of the opposition within the Corinthian synagogue to Paul. You know, and I think we have to realise that, that as Christians, it can be costly, can't it? It can be costly, not so much in New Zealand yet, but it can be costly. It can cost you your job, it can cost you relationships, it can cost you friendships. But as Paul acknowledged, it's a very small price to pay for eternal life. And Paul, we know, suffered a lot in his work for the gospel. We know that he's been beaten with rods multiple times, he's been stoned and left for dead, he's been shipwrecked, he's been abused and castigated. He's had a lot of, a lot of trouble from, from his work of ministry in the gospel. And we know that when you, when you read his letter to the Corinthian church, he actually states in it that he was fearful of coming to Corinth because he wasn't sure what kind of reception he would receive from the people there. And yet he still came. And it was during that very difficult period when things had got so tough in the synagogue that he had to leave and establish himself in the house of Tidius Justice that he actually has a vision from God. God comes to him at night when I think Paul was probably at a low point, discouraged, and says to him that while he might be challenged in his work for the gospel in Corinth, in no way would he ever be physically harmed and that to take courage there were many believers in the city. His work was not in vain. And on the face of that encouragement, Paul then continues doing what he's doing for the next 18 months and a very strong church is established in Corinth. Over that 18 months, we've got Gallio. He's been appointed as the proconsul of Achaia of that main region of Greece. And the Jews decide to make a very shrewd, a very politically minded attack on Paul. They decide to bring a case before the Roman provincial government accusing Paul of establishing a new religion. Now in, Macedon, in, Phil, sorry, in Thessalonica, what did the Jews do? They went down to the local agora, they rounded up some disreputable people and they stirred up a crowd of thugs basically and they caused trouble in the town. In Philippi, they went and took a case before the local civic authorities. Here in Corinth, they bring a case before the Roman provincial governor. That's a huge step up. Any decision in Philippi that the local civic authorities would have made would have just been for that town only. But when the governor of a whole province makes a decision about something, it affects every town and settlement and city within that province. And it would have set a precedent that would have actually been taken up by other Roman governors in other districts around the Roman world. And that could, this one decision being made in Corinth, could have huge ramifications for the Christian church in those early days. Could have had huge ramifications because the accusation that Paul was trying to establish a new religion, instead of just being an offshoot of Judaism, to establish a new religion was actually against Roman law. People had been executed for it in the past. People had lost their lives. So this was a really serious charge. And if it was accepted, not only would Paul have been executed, it meant that the Christian church would have lost its privileges and exemptions that they enjoyed by being seen as part of the Jewish faith. So the, the, the Jews bring their charges before Gallio, who's sitting on that seat in the beamer that we saw earlier. And before Paul can even say a word in his defence, Gallio gets up and says, Look, this is just a matter of internal dispute. This is just a matter that you Jews are arguing about the meaning of words. This is not a serious matter. Look, 
Case dismissed, get out of here. Which is fantastic news for the Christians because that set a precedent going in the other direction. And for the next 20 to 30 years, Christianity basically suffered no persecution from the Roman state. Not until the destruction of the temple in AD 70 did the Roman, did it was recognised that Christianity and Judaism were actually two separate things. But until that time, Christianity was able to flourish because there was no opposition against it. Paul doesn't even get to say a word and the charge is just completely dismissed. But something interesting happens. Sosthenes, the new synagogue ruler, gets beaten up by the locals in the Agora. And that says to me, and also the way in which Gallio didn't even wait for Paul to say a word in his defence, that, that the people of the city of Corinth, and maybe in other places as well, like we see with Claudius expelling the Jews from Rome, they'd got so sick of all this infighting that they were just fed up with it. So he says, look, case dismissed. And the locals, so fed up with it as well, turned on Sosthenes, the local synagogue ruler, and kind of roughed him up a little bit. People were frustrated and sick and tired of this internal wrangling that was going on with the Jews and the way they were responding to Christianity. Paul, we know, hangs around for another couple of years, for about five years in total, and establishes the church very strongly in Corinth before he moves off to Syria. Now, there are a lot of lessons from this passage that we could learn and take from. There's a lot of history around the development of the early church and how the decisions made there impacted on how the church actually did. But there's one decision in particular, one aspect in particular I want to pick up on. And it's the issue of money. We don't often talk about money in church, do we? For various reasons. And yet money, like time, talents and energy, is a resource that when fully committed to God has the power to do a lot of good for the kingdom of God. And conversely, it can also hamper the kingdom if it's used unwisely or through its lack of availability. Paul says in 1 Timothy 16 that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And at the time of Paul there were a lot of people who used to wander around going from city to city earning a living by applying some kind of new truth or story. They'd turn up in a town, they'd preach in the local agora and they'd gather a group of followers who would give them some money and that was how they earned their living. Paul was accused of being one of those in Athens. He was called a spermologos, a seed picker, one who went around gathering up disparate ideas and melding them together to create some new version of the truth that he would then promote to people around the place. And to be honest, it still happens today. When I say the word TV evangelist, what do you think? You know, immediately I get the reaction, you know. There are some good ones, of course, but I've seen some horrendous stuff on the TV from these guys. And it's because, unlike Paul, you know, they are seeking to earn a living from the gospel and it's caused them to step over the line in really big ways at times, I believe. Paul, mindful of those traps, chose instead for himself to be self-supporting. But the flip side of that is that that his time that he was able to spend in doing ministry was limited because he did have to earn a living. And it was only on those times when he received gifts like he did from Philippi that he was unable to be released to do the full-time work of the ministry to which God had called him. When someone becomes a Christian, a disciple of Christ, they are giving lordship of their life in every area over to God. Every area, including their time, their energy, their talents, and yes, even their money. The money that any of us here today earn is not actually our own. The money that I earn is not my own. The money that Nikki earns is not her own. It is a resource that Nikki and I need to prayerfully discern how God intends us to use it in his service. And God gives us some guidance for that within the scriptures. We need to give first, the Bible would tell us, to the work of God. Like Israel, the first portion of the harvest went to support God's work in the community. Then we are to take care of our own needs. And lastly, (coughs) we are to care for others in need. And if you choose to call yourself a Christian, 
which means to publicly declare in your baptismal vows that Jesus is Lord, then you must, as a natural consequence, allow Christ's lordship over your finances just as much as any other area of your life. And it is only when the whole church of God does that that it will be able to fulfil its mission. Here in the West we are so much individualistic and believe that we are masters of our own destiny that we think we are the ones, if we are Christian, that control what we do with our money. No, we're not. If you are a Christian, you should give lordship of your finances just as you give lordship of your time, talents and energy every area of your life. And so my challenge to us all this morning, myself included, is this. Is God Lord of our finances? Is he Lord of our money? Do we consult God before we make financial decisions? Are you supporting <coughs> God's work with your finances? Even if it's just the widow's might. Because if you're not, then in reality you're not being obedient to God's call on your life as a disciple. And I would encourage you to go home and have a conversation with God about it. Prayer. And a prayer you might pray is a very simple one, just like this. God, how would you have me manage my finances? That's it. And then listen. Now I know that today, as in all ages, there are many people who struggle. They can't even get by with what they currently earn. So I'm not saying to people here today that you suddenly start giving a tenth of your income to the church. I'm not saying that at all, especially if it means your children go hungry. But I am asking that you pray about the principle of allowing God to be Lord over all of your life, time, energy and talents, including your finances. And who knows how God will guide you when you ask and pray those prayers. It might be that time and talents are given in exchange for what you would like to give but can't. But we're all called to be a part of God's mission. We're all participating in some way. And for that mission to be effective, we all need to allow God to be truly Lord over our time, our energy, our talents and our finances. So let us pray.